Truth Espresso, episode 43. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> And now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. This is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Hello, this is Daniel Minnick, your host for Truth Espresso. Welcome, and I hope you are having a good day in the midst of this crazy time. I hope that you are practicing social distancing properly while also not panicking. I hope you are trusting God, and I hope you can avoid being the biggest cynic in the world and maybe gain a a good perspective on how power can be used and abused. The title of this episode is Inflation, Legalized Counterfeiting? I remember as a kid hearing about the word inflation and how prices just keep going up gradually over time. I asked why this happens. And if I remember correctly, here was the answer. Well, you see, there are always workers in some industry somewhere who get greedy. They protest for higher wages and refuse to work until their employers are forced to give them what they want to stay in business. To offset the cost of these now higher wages, the employers must charge more to their buyers. Eventually, everyone on the market has to adjust their prices to recoup the costs of those original workers bidding up their wages. Ultimately, those who absorb the higher prices are those workers on fixed incomes who don't have enough bargaining power to get more wages for themselves, and that's how things become more expensive for certain people as prices rise and some people's wages don't rise fast enough. Well, nice theory, but that is not what inflation is. A lot of people don't understand what inflation is. Even the President of the United States of America can be a victim of inflation ignorance. During the stagflation of the 1970s, President Gerald Ford pushed for a voluntary win campaign in 1974. Win, W-I-N, standing for Whip Inflation Now. What were his proposals? That people should carpool, that people should use air conditioning less, or that people should lick their dinner plates clean and engage in other energy-saving actions for inflation fighters, that people should plant some gardens in their house. Nope, sorry, President Ford, the 12% inflation rate that was going on in 1974 was not being caused by profligate living standards. Nice try, though. Well, if that's not what inflation is, what really is inflation? Well, you'd have to ask the dictionary if you want to get a good definition of inflation, but then the question of that is, what dictionary? You see, The definition of inflation has changed over time, and this change has been fairly recent. According to InflationData.com, in a 2010 article entitled The Real Definition of Inflation, Inflation Data quotes from Webster's Dictionary in 1983. Now, there would be some understandable influences that would help 
a dictionary in 1983 to hold to the historic definition of inflation because 1983 was only 12 years after President Richard Nixon severed the final foreign link between the U.S. dollar and gold that thereby collapsed the Bretton Woods system that had actually only been in place for 27 years. Now, talking about the Bretton Woods system would definitely be an interesting topic for another episode. So if you want to learn about the Bretton Woods system right now, how about you read about it? Or you can stay tuned and wait for another exciting episode of Truth Espresso as we go through economic history. Now, after several years of stagflation and wage and price controls in the 1970s, and Fed Chairman Paul Volcker managed to save the dollar from runaway inflation by raising the federal fund's interest rate to 20%. So I was just giving the background for why the Webster's Dictionary in 1983 would define inflation thusly, quote, an increase in the amount of currency in circulation, resulting in a relatively sharp and sudden fall in its value and rise in prices, unquote. That's the first part of the definition for inflation, according to Webster's Dictionary in 1983. So, according to dictionaries, in this recent time, 1983, the definition of inflation was an increase in the supply of currency in circulation, and that the result of that was an increase in prices. At this time, in 1983, people understood well the link between growing the money supply and rising prices, but now, not so much. As President Nixon declared, quote, I am now a Keynesian in economics, unquote, the field of economics in academia has been dominated by Keynesian economics. Economic policies of Democrats and Republicans have only upticked more and more Keynesian. And every member of the Federal Reserve Board, including the chairman or chairwoman, as was the case with Janet Yellen not so long ago, has been only Keynesian consistently for decades. So, you might be asking, just what is Keynesian economics? Well, you just might have to stick around for a while and listen to Truth Espresso. Hey, I've got to pique your interest a little bit here. I've got to keep you listening. So you could do your own research or you can be highly entertained by episodes of Truth Espresso as we go through more economics and we'll go through economic history coming up pretty soon. Now, we just looked at Webster's Dictionary in 1983 that said that inflation was an increase in the amount of currency in circulation resulting in a rise in prices. Now, let's look at the Merriam-Webster Dictionary today. If you go to merriam-webster.com and look for the word inflation, here is the definition for the field of economics. Quote, a continuing rise in the general price level, usually attributed to an increase in the volume of money and credit relative to available goods and services. Unquote. Did you notice the subtle change? Now, the definition of inflation has shifted from being an increase in the supply of money to an increase in quote, the general price level, unquote, that is, quote, usually attributed to, unquote, an increase in the supply of money. This definition change is certainly significant. Think about this. 
the definition of inflation over the, the last few decades has changed from its cause to its effect. So originally the definition was an increase in currency that resulted in an increase in prices. Now it has been changed to the increase in prices that is usually attributed to an increase in currency. This is a complete flip. This is a complete reversal in the definition of a word. And that is because the culture has changed. Economic teaching has changed. Policy in government has definitely changed to adjust to this definition. So why is this the case? Because economists now want to separate the two. They want to sever the cause of creating more money from the effect of rising prices. Now, obviously, the prices of certain things could rise from factors other than an increase in money. For instance, a drought can destroy a bunch of crops and make the supply of those crops scarcer, and that would cause the prices to rise. But economists now want to act as if you can completely separate the two, that increasing the supply of money does not necessarily have any link to an increase in prices. Why? Because the mainstream of economic thought in almost the entire world now has been duped by the teachings of John Maynard Keynes to believe that there can be a strong demand for more money that doesn't ultimately result in higher prices. I mean, what do these Keynesian economists think that people do with all that new money if it doesn't result in increasing prices? Do they eat it? <laughs> and as I said before, if you want to learn more about Keynesian economics, you can stay tuned for future episodes of Truth Espresso. So, what really is inflation? Now, historically, in economic thought, just as the 1983 Webster's Dictionary defined it, it was the increase in the supply of money. It is not the increase in prices. It is the increase in the supply of money. So how does increasing the supply of money matter? I mean, let's give a certain scenario where you could have inflation. Let's say that a lunch typically costs $10 and that the total supply of money in the economy is $50 trillion. Now, if you were to double that supply of money to $100 trillion, you could expect the price of lunch to double to $20. Now, that would be no big deal if everyone's part of the money supply also doubled proportionately. I mean, if you doubled the supply of money and then you gave everyone double the money that they possessed... Sure, prices would double, but everyone would be able to buy the exact same amount of stuff just the same. The only issue would be the effort involved in adjusting the list price of things posted, but otherwise, nothing is actually more expensive in this scenario. But is this what we're talking about when we talk about inflation? Is this what really happens when the supply of money causes prices to go up? If it were really that simple, if there were really no real issue with inflation, I wouldn't be recording this episode, now would I? So now, let's look at another example of inflation that might be a little more apropos. Let's look at counterfeiting. This is when someone creates his own money that looks like real money. So the counterfeiter manages to reproduce the money in circulation from his own printing press. And the counterfeiter is then able to create $10 bills, $50 bills, $100 bills, and then is able to spend these into the economy. 
So just why is counterfeiting bad? Why do we all recognize that counterfeiting is bad? As you probably guessed, it allows the counterfeiter to deceive sellers into giving up valuable goods or services for something that is essentially worthless. This counterfeited money is not backed by any goods or services that the counterfeiter contributed to the economy for an even trade. In effect, the seller has worked for free, giving away real wealth to the counterfeiter. So counterfeiting then is theft. It is a dishonest redistribution of wealth. We can see this dishonest redistribution of wealth evident in the prophet Hosea's accusation against the southern kingdom of Judah. If we go to Hosea chapter 12 and look at verses 7 through 8, quote, He, referring to Judah, is a merchant. The balances of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. And Ephraim said, Yet I am become rich, I have found me out substance. In all my labors they shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. Unquote. So the Old Testament quite often condemns dishonest trade that deceives a buyer or seller into making a drastically uneven trade. The deceiver gets rich by making the laborer get poorer. This is a transfer of wealth to the one in control of the scales to make participation in the economy more and more expensive for those doing the actual work. Those in control of the scales get more and more wealth and free labor. In Bible times and before the printing press and paper money, there were still methods of counterfeiting or inflation some kings and governments clipped coins and you know from a a recent episode i mentioned coins that had milled edges corrugated edges that were a visual clue to prevent this kind of coin clipping or shaving the edges and using the clippings to melt into other coins to increase the purchasing power of those who clipped coins. Milled edges were a defense mechanism to prevent this kind of coin clipping. So some kings and governments in the past clipped coins to melt into more coins or they diluted the base precious metals such as gold or silver in some coins with cheaper metals such as iron or tin to grant them more purchasing power. But paper money makes this process of inflation and diluting the currency much easier than with metal coins. Hey, which is easier? Having to go through the work of melting together a bunch of different metals into coins to dilute their value or just simply running a printing press and printing up a bunch of more dollar bills? So who are in control of the scales today in the United States of America, Uh, the land of the fee and the home of the slave? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The land of the free and the home of the brave. So who are in control of the economic scales today that the prophet Hosea would talk about? The merchant deceiving and becoming rich by deceit and making the laborer get poorer. Remember the previous episode where I talked about banking and in particular fractional reserve banking? Since 1913, the Federal Reserve Bank was established by law as the third iteration of a national bank. Did you know that there were times in the history of the United States where there was no national bank? There was a time between the second national bank during the Industrial Revolution up and until 1913 where the third national bank was formed. And this third national bank is called the Federal Reserve Bank. This bank is sanctioned by the Congress as the so-called lender of last resort. 
The Federal Reserve, or the Fed for short, has the power to create new money out of thin air and loan it to member commercial banks at interest. These banks in turn lend their money at higher interest rates to borrowers, like you and me, for things like mortgages. So think about it. When you work hard to produce real wealth in the economy to pay your bills and to pay your mortgage, you are ultimately paying interest on a loan to a bank that lends out depositors' money as if it were the bank's own assets. Uh, you are also paying for them to pay back interest for so-called borrowing money from the Fed. Well, where does the Fed get this money to loan out? Easy. They print it. They credit digits to an electronic account. In other words, they create it out of thin air. Since 1913, when the Federal Reserve was established, the value of the dollar has gone down 98% of what it originally was worth. So, a dollar today is worth about two cents of what the dollar of 1913 could buy if it could buy today's goods. Ouch, just think about that. Now, how can an institution called the lender of last resorts devalue the dollar by 98%? And especially as the Federal Reserve is said to be the protector of the value of the dollar. Just think about that for a little bit. Just let that set in. Does that anger you a little bit? We're not finished yet. Now, when the government engages in deficit spending, you know, when they spend more money than they raise in already high taxes... Where do they get it from? Well, the Fed creates it out of thin air through various means such as buying U.S. Treasury bonds or quantitative easing methods and buying failed mortgage-backed securities or lowering the reserve ratio for fractional reserve commercial banks so that they can lend out more money that they don't have in depositor reserves. So all these tools that the Fed has are as engines of inflation. They create more money to circulate into the economy. And here's the problem with all this. As the Fed creates new money, someone obviously gets it first. So who gets this money first? The government? Member banks? or various corporations that lobbyists for those corporations manage to get into appropriations bills in Congress. These special interests get to spend the newly created money into the economy in exchange for, of course, goods or services on the market. You know, real wealth. As the money circulates and changes hands, the prices of things will eventually adjust for the increased demand for the supply of goods and services. Eventually, those of us who are actually working to make the economy go round see things get more expensive. More money ends up chasing the existing or increased supply of goods and services in the economy. Sure, the economy still grows, but the purchasing power to buy the available goods and services increases faster for those who get this free money from the trough of the Fed and the government. And those who suffer the most see their cost of living increase. Those who suffer the most and see their cost of living increase are those on fixed incomes or those in retirement. So think about this. 
the government spends money it didn't get in taxes. And of course, the issue of taxation that our current government does can also be the subject of another episode. But think about this. When the government passes new spending bills, when they talk about increasing the debt ceiling, when the federal debt keeps going up every year, what is going on? The money supply is increasing. But remember that illustration that I talked about earlier ago? (laughs) It's not as if the money in everyone's pocket has now gone up at the same rate as the money has increased in the economy. No, someone gets new money and is able to trade it for goods and services that benefit them. And then the people at the end, as the money has circulated through the economy, see their prices rise, their cost of living increase, as they are working to make ends meet, to contribute to the economy, and yet they're not in on this free money trough. They're the ones working hard to give value to the money that the government and lobbying corporations or any friends of the Federal Reserve get with the free money. These people get free purchasing power to buy the things that labor produces. So think about this. Inflation is really a form of tax. It's really a sinister undercover form of tax that robs you behind your back. Let's ask this obvious question. What really is the difference between counterfeiting and the Federal Reserve System, or really any inflationary banking system in any country around the world for that matter? Not a whole lot, as you can see. It is the same method of transferring wealth by creating new currency. It robs wealth From those who work hard, it makes indentured servants out of citizens. It is an indirect and sinister tax. It's like having a thief secretly stealing a small portion of your household earnings slowly over time while you are left scratching your head wondering why the cost of living keeps getting more expensive and you have to keep working hard, but for some reason you just have the ability to buy less and less. And guess what? The economists who provide for this kind of system of banking and inflation, this system of stealing your purchasing power by essentially counterfeiting new money and getting to spend it themselves, people who advocate for this system will try to tell you that rising prices are for your good. Like, you need to see prices keep going up because that forces you to participate in the economy by spending more money. Because they'll tell you that if prices were to fall, you would stop spending and you would save money waiting for prices to fall even more. As if, you know, you would starve to death to save a penny more in the future than you'd saved a penny tomorrow or today. That's absurd, but most economists now would actually teach that. That falling prices are always bad and always lead to recessions and depressions. Well, of course, some causes of prices falling result in a recession or a depression. But think about the way technology works. Technology industry. Uh, Remember cell phones from a few decades ago when they were first introduced. Only the very rich had them. Think of how the service then compares to today, like where if you were a really rich person, you got one of those really cool cell phones that cost you know, over a thousand dollars and was like holding a brick to your ear and had this loud, obnoxious 
beep when you pushed those touch tone buttons and there was no texting feature there was no video feature video conferencing or browsing the internet on them um think of how the price of technology has fallen dramatically that has not led to depressions and recessions It has only led to the increase of the economy. Falling prices in technology has allowed people to have more than one computing device. I mean, a lot of even poor people now in the United States have a smartphone that's capable of video conferencing and playing games and buying things on Amazon. And then they might have a desktop computer that has been collecting dust because who uses desktops much anymore? And they might have a laptop that they use for other features when they need a bigger screen. And they might have a tablet or maybe two tablet computers. And then they might have a game console that's connected to a TV and they have a TV in the living room and a TV in the bedroom and maybe a TV in each bedroom and a TV in the basement. Just think about how prices drop like a rock in the technology industry as innovation makes things cheaper. But that doesn't make people postpone buying laptops and TVs because they're always waiting for the prices to fall. But economists would tell you that, that falling prices are this horrible thing. And so the economy needs inflation. You know, we need a target inflation rate of 2% per year because because 1% per year is so horrible and maybe 3% per year is too much, but somehow 2% per year is the ideal inflation rate that just keeps making things slowly get more expensive. So you have to keep buying things and, you know, paying more money and, you know, that might hurt you, but it's really contributing to the economy. But think about it. What causes that 2% or whatever inflation rate per year? It's not a natural phenomenon. It's because the banking system creates new currency out of thin air and people connected with that system, the government or lobbying corporations, get that newly created money first. And then they're able to buy things, real things, real wealth with that phony garbage new money. And they buy up things for themselves. And that causes a crunch on your living standards because there's less available for you. And things get more expensive for you. And you have nothing to do with it. You have no way to prevent it. Doesn't that sound like thievery? Isn't that counterfeiting? No, God in his law, in his word, never provided for a central bank like this. He commanded not to muzzle the ox that treads the corn. He commanded that scales must be honest and just. They must be even scales. He condemned false balances. He never sanctioned any system of money that allowed anyone to control the supply at a whim and buy the labor of others with cheap, phony, funny money. God created and demands sound money. And I hope you, if this has enlightened your mind, I hope you would agree that a sound money system that allows you, the laborer, to keep more of the fruits of your labor and not have them thieved away by governments and a banking system protected by law from being able to create and print money that is backed by your labor and by your productivity at your expense for free for them. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. 
If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso.